Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. What makes a hit Broadway musical? Apparently, it's adapting a subtle Israeli film from 10 years ago. <laughs> the band's visit, which has deservedly won an Obie for Best Musical, as well as the New York uh, Drama Critics Award, tells the story of an Egyptian orchestra stuck for an evening in a small desert town in Israel. While only on the hunt for a bite to eat and a place to stay, the band and the town's inhabitants end up getting a bit more than they bargained for. Please welcome from the band's visit, director David Cromer, composer and lyricist David Yazbek, author Itamar Moses, and incredible star Katrina Lank. Round of applause, everybody. Holy moly, congratulations, you guys. I saw the, I saw the show on Saturday. It's incredible. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. It's a, it's a real achievement, both as just, a, I think, as a, what you expect from a musical, but then also in a subtle way subverting what you expect uh, from the musical. I want to talk about how all this started. How did someone decide to adapt the band's visit into a musical? All right. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's you. I love this story because it, uh, it involves our producer, Oren Wolf, our lead producer, who is a great creative producer, a young guy. This is his first Broadway show. He saw the movie when it came out um, and he thought this could be staged. Uh, originally, he thought it could be a play with some music. Uh, then he came around to the idea of it being a musical, and then he started calling us. <laughs> and almost no, one, almost no one around him agreed that it was a good idea, which I think is interesting. Uh, because sometimes, on some level, you're supposed to have someone, three people tell you you're drunk, you should lie down. But he stayed up uh, and, and kept pursuing it. And sometimes that's a fool's errand. And in the case of the band's visit, he turned out to be right. Absolutely, he turned out to be right. But I will also say it's not surprising because on paper, you, I think most people would be like, I don't, know. I don't know about that. That's a musical. It really takes kind of seeing it and having the vision to know that it's going to work. Yeah, How I mean, even as, as we were writing it, <laughs> several people, including my, my father, <laughs> consistently, you know, on a weekly basis, were like, I don't see how, I don't see how that's, how can you do that? But I think that might be actually a, a, a green flag for, a, for a, an adaptation. Yeah, we've talked about this a lot, actually, about the sort of, um, a lot of things that turn out to be good ideas for musicals or for adaptations in general turn out to be counterintuitive. Um, and I think it's because there's almost, there's, like when, when it's really obvious in advance why something is a good idea, there's often a trap there. It's because um, you think you can see the entire thing before you've even begun. But all that means artistically is there's no discoveries to make along the way. Whereas something that has like, oh, I, I'm compelled by this, but I don't quite see how to do it. it th you have to, s the, the act of solving all of those things along the way is sort of what gives it the, the energy that it ends up having. Spoken like a true writer. <laughs> well, it's easy to say that now that it turns right, out to right, work. Yeah, yeah. Like, this, is all, this is all easy hindsight. Yeah, there's a, there's a parallel timeline in which we're all like, I told you it wasn't going to work. <laughs> Luckily, we're in this one. So. Were, there mo were there incidents like that with the three of you working together and crafting this? I think before, before David came on, there were certainly incidents like in the elevator after, <laughs> after a meeting of Itamar and I looking at each other and just like just barely perceptible head shakes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and even and even when we were, um, you know, in rehearsals and in previews downtown at the Atlantic, where we first did the show off Broadway, um, we all had to take turns reassuring each other. You know, yeah. once a week, one of us would lose heart and be like, "Is it too subtle? Is it too spare? Is it too?" quiet and you know luckily there were enough of us and and Oren also as David mentioned uh to say to, to sort of like shore up our courage and be like no let's commit to to the vision that we had also I, I one thing I think is kind of interesting is I think when when we part of the narrative of oh I don't know if this is a good idea for a musical I don't see how this could be a musical what I think people mean is I don't see how this story could be done with a whole bunch of people on stage dancing their asses off belting yeah. crying uh, doing a lot of shtick you know what I mean like roaring through marching through it, having a lot of energy and running in and out with scenery flying around but that's not the show but uh, that's not the show but that's what people mean when they say oh I can't see this being a musical they, they see they can't see it being that kind of a musical but that's only one kind of theater that's only one way to execute something and there's a zillion there is an infinite number of ways to so th so what we had to just keep remembering was we're doing a musical of this so it will be this kind it will be the kind of musical it, it, it became it will be this thing that is kind of um, uh, a human scale 
and um, uh, told with some with has has its own kind of patience, has uh, kind of the spareness of the environment that it takes place in, rather than bustling streets of you know Beit Hatikva, you know, which we don't really have <laughs> in in our town, which is like baguettes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, how do you Falafel feel? Wagon. I mean, when you move from somewhere like the Atlantic to Broadway. Uh, and even when you're doing it at the Atlantic, if you're not a musical that's, you know, bustling streets and, you know, 100 or something extras and changing scenery, how do you fill that space to make sure that an audience who would go to that big musical is also still going to understand and gravitate towards uh, the band's visit, which is going to be operating on a more subtle level? Well, I mean, one, one way is you try to engage the audience every split second of the show. You try to engage them, not just <clears throat> those of us writing it and directing it, but also the the people on stage are engaging the audience deeply every moment so that everything that happens uh, they care about. That's the, that's the goal, that's the aim. It is, not, it is not necessarily, it is not a, an absolute fact that you have to be constantly uh, flashing the lights on and often jumping up and down in order to hold an audience's attention. Uh, 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 and I know you're not saying that, but but that that's one of the things people keep running into. Yes, but you're not jumping up and down all the time. But we can be we are engaged by different things all the time. We're engaged by so it's not like we're saying oh it's a little bit quieter, it's a little bit more subtle, it takes its time a little bit. We're just laying back on our heels and we don't care about the audience. We care profoundly <laughs> about their attention, as you say, to to attempt to engage them at every moment to take them through this story. Yeah, I mean, the play is loaded with character development and jokes right off, right off the bat. It's, in, it's incredibly funny from, from the, right from the first minute of the show. Can you talk about adapting uh, the play, or the, the book from the, from the film? Um, well, the movie's terrific, and everyone should see it if you, if you haven't. Um, and while it's incredibly spare, one thing that it had, and this was clear to me from the first time that I watched it, it has a very simple but rigorous structure, which is a great starting point. I mean, it's super simple. It's the band shows up, they realize they're in the wrong place, they ask for a place to stay, and then we follow sort of three or four different strands as they split up for the night, and then the strands sort of come back together and they leave. And, and, and it, it, when you're... Um, Book writing, beyond the dialogue and the other things that it entails, on the deepest level, book writing for musicals is entirely about structure. It's about creating a, a, a strong foundation that the songs and everything else can rest on. So the movie sort of had that. So, so on that level, um, I, I got to start you know, on second base or third base. Right. Um, then it was a question of, um, OK, but film is a visual medium. We have close-ups of people's face, faces. We have these gorgeous, bleak shots of you know, an empty desert street. You can't do quite that on stage or not with the same storytelling impact. So then it was a process of like building out certain characters, building out certain events, not so much that it would tip over or violate the spirit of the film, but enough that it could sustain on stage in a way that it wouldn't if you simply beat for beat took the film and put it on stage. So, so it was, it was uh, the, way, the metaphor I've come up with to describe it is that it was like taking an already very beautiful and delicate plant and trying to transfer it to another container without killing it. Talk about the fear <laughs> of that of that tip over point, because one of the you know the rules of drama and of plays is that every character on stage, for the most part, I mean you have a whole band here, right. but every character on stage has to have a reason sort of for being there and have right. some kind of conflict. And if you have this sort of structure where it's just sort of they come into this town and they meet these people and then they leave the next day. Yeah. How did you find conflicts for everybody that didn't in any way sort of betray that sort of um, subtle structure? Well, in a way, again, it, be, it begins with the film. I mean, what, one way of describing what happens in the film and also in, in our show is that the people show up and you sort of think it might be about, oh, there's going to be tension between these strangers and the locals or, you know, uh, and it ends up being this thing where the internal, by encountering these strangers, people on both sides of this uh, divide, the, the musicians and the, and the locals, um, an internal struggle for them is somehow brought to the surface and, and, been a, and sort of not healed or fixed quite, but exposed so that they can make a little bit of progress, like a tiny bit of progress in their life. And, um, and that only is possible because of the encounter with these strangers. Um, so, so, so that was what I tried to focus on as the, um, you know, we think conflict in, in, in a play or in a musical has to mean, 
you know, uh, you know, there's an, you know, this uh, person totally betrays this person and steals a million dollars from them, and then they chase them and try to kill them. It doesn't have to be that. It can be, I've been living kind of a lie in a very quiet way for 15 years, or you know what I mean, or or this terrible thing happened to me, but I've never completely faced and dealt with it. I mean, those are the enormous sort of weights that are on most actual people in their actual lives. You know, bank robberies happen pretty rarely. So, um, and oftentimes bank robberies happen because of those subtle problems sure. that people are existing with. Right, you know, never underestimate the psych psychological. Um, <laughs> uh, so, is there a big bank robbery musical? There, there is now. Yeah. Uh, can we make the happen. Dog Day Afternoon musical? That Good idea. Fun. Attica! <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it was just yeah so it was so it was uh everything that sort of was added event wise was an outgrowth of what was already in the film you know pumping up certain uh certain certain seeds that were already that were already there Katrina uh I have taken 10 minutes to to, to get to you I'm so sorry you're incredible in the show uh your your voice you're going to sing for us in just a minute and it's going to be uh amazing but also your uh your posture and what you're doing with your body and how you present this character right off the bat how did you find that yeah not right now your body and your you look great Posture's right now terrible right now uh, uh no but in the in the show you you have this way like the 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 physicality that you present this character with where did you find that uh, I would say it originated from uh, studying people who reminded me of this character, and we we had the good fortune um, to be exposed to Gaga, which is a um, Israeli dance. Gaga. Gaga. It's called. It's an Israeli. It was um, uh, the man who kind of created it was uh, uh, an Israeli, and they have, there's a dance company called Batsheva, um, and this movement style is all based on. Instead of making shapes, uh, you move in a way that feels a certain way. So it's a um, like a pleasure based, which sounds weird, but like you know, imagine you have this uh, feathers under your skin, or imagine your spine is made of seaweed. Um, so we got to take classes, Gaga classes, uh, off Broadway, and also in this in this run, which I think kind of helped everyone sort of key into the physicality of uh, people that are different from them, and also. Uh, you know, in Israel, living, it's a kind of a different way of being in your body when you're in the heat and with the sun and sand everywhere. And um, that was sort of the in. It's such a kind of a <clears throat> dominant pose, the way that she presents herself. It's somewhat, and she's almost like trying to intimidate everybody. Is she? <laughs> I felt so. <laughs> the uh, voice and the kind of like sh shoulders and hips out sort of thing. Um... I don't know that that's her intention, but that's really, that's interesting. Uh, that's, what say, I maybe, uh, that's what I got. The character I, that I Katrina that. plays is, uh, is Dina, who's sort of the, uh, it's this tiny town, and she owns the one cafe in town, and sort of the, de not literally the mayor of the town, but the sort of figurative de facto yeah. mayor of the town. And also, like, if you know yourself, and you've been through a lot of stuff, and you've endured it, uh, there's not a lot of apology in how you stand. Like she's, That's it. she's very sure of where she's been, and it's fine. She's fine, and this is me. So, there it is. Yeah. And. Maybe that's what's coming across as. Uh, I think that's it. That's a better description of what I what <laughs> I said. That's much more articulate. Uh, how how when did you join the show and like how early along was it in terms of how far the 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 the, the lyrics and the and the music were along? Uh, I came on for the off Broadway production that we did at the Atlantic, uh, and I think it was pretty much the show was pretty much. Uh, Ninety five percent. Yeah, there. yeah. How long was the uh, was getting it to ninety five percent? When did you guys start, and how long did it take? The I wrote my very first draft of the script, which was just I wrote it as a script with with no songs, and at the same time, Yazbek was sort of writing the first one or two songs for it, and that writing happened. I'm going to say, in the fall of um, 2013 or winter 2014. I want to say, yeah. So so it was about. It was like t three years from then to opening off Broadway, which is insanely fast for a new musical, actually. Really? Three years is really fast. Am I, would you agree with that? Would you say that's pretty fast? Well, my, my first show was one year. Okay, so never mind. It's slow. <laughs> no, no, no. That was, the, that was an outlier. The, my next, to see somebody else get contradicted on this stage. My next, show is, my next show is seven years, so you're, yeah. I think you're sort of right. Yeah, and the musicals I'd worked on previously before this were, were more, more like five or six years to get to their first production. So, um, 
but yeah, so it was it was you know four years before we we ended up on Broadway. How did you engage with the the music of the orchestra, or sort of how did you bring that the music of this orchestra into the kind of like classical musical numbers that you were writing as well? Well, there, there's uh, the type of music that this Egyptian orchestra plays is known as Oriental music or Arab classical music. That's what they do. That's why they're cultural, you know, of cultural interest. Um, and I've always loved that kind of music uh, from an early age. Not that I've listened to it all the time, but I, I've always understood it, appreciated it. So I got excited about writing in that idiom and writing for those instruments. And then finding, finding great musicians, you know, of the, of the quality that we have, these world-class musicians, that goes a long, long way because all of a sudden I'm not worrying about scales and microtones and certain kinds of rhythms. Um, I can just make a demo that sort of gets near it, and then all of a sudden it comes to life. Right, you know. They can kind of hear what you're working on and throw back sort of how they could be a part of it? Yeah, and they can teach me as well. I mean, I'll, I, I, the good thing is I can do that stuff, but I also know where the hook is. So I can write um, a piece for that group that a, a Western audience and I think also probably a Middle Eastern audience would appreciate maybe leaning towards different reasons to appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, David, uh, was it always going to be that you brought the band together for the final moment of the show and had them perform the sort of uh, the, the classic music? Well, I, I, I guess I got to say we have to go back to the film, which is it is the closing credits of the film that you see the, the band concert in, in Petra Tikva. And, and for a long time, it was... Uh, for a long time, the end of the end of the show was the the, the way it is now, which is that it ends just before. Uh, well, I shouldn't give too much away, but it, that, that that doesn't happen. And before the meteor hits the town the and everyone hits dies. The town. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say though, uh, I mean, well, I, I hate I hate talking about spoilers, but like this is one of those shows where even if something was spoiled for you, you would yeah, still yeah. love it. It's not about the the ending. It's not about a surprise. It's about the journey there. Well, you, you get know? to see a beautiful and and bec and I would I would say we always had the. The, the, they had written, these guys had written, and we had sort of conceived the idea that it would end where it ends, where you see it ends, where the blackout happens in the show, and that that would be satisfying unto itself as a story, particularly if, say, we did not have these world-class musicians on stage. If the thing had been, like in the film, about a group of actors playing musicians uh, uh, who don't play on screen, but as it became, as we watched throughout the course of the show, one of David's original ideas was that you would occasionally see one person playing by themselves in an alley on a street under a street light, you know, and that that would sort of build up and add up to something. It just became a logical conclusion to say, once we've had these master musicians, these, these, just these, these dazzling uh, players who play throughout the show at various times right in the audience's lap in a very beautiful way, that it just became sort of inevitable that we had to give them a, a big moment. But it's funny, end. David, because that's how I remember it, but I was also in my studio and just happened to be looking under a pile of junk, which is what my studio basically consists of. And I found this script from a few years ago. And it was the, it was the title page, and had all these notes all over it. And one note was, concert at end, question mark. And then the word baffo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I came in late, and what I think, part of the experience has been at various times, everyone would have separately things that all seem to be common ideas. I'm not, I'm not arguing with that. I'm saying that it just sort of makes sense that we would get to see the band. And I think the only question would have been, oh, would that be, will it be Bafo or will it not be Bafo? Big uh, question. Yeah. But yeah. Or would, it be, would it be satisfying or would it be cheesy? And we decided it would be satisfying. Oh, it's, ab it's yeah. absolutely satisfying. Yeah. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a question right here? Hi. Thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, my main question is for Mr. David Yazbek. Um, I'm a big fan of Women on the Verge. And wow, thank you. I am. And uh, the, it's such a good show. Uh, and there's a cut track called Mother's Day or a cut song. Is there any songs in the band's visit in the, maybe the previous workshops that maybe Miss Katrina Link was supposed to sing but, or favorite moments you had? First of all, Mother's Day was not cut. We did it in England as well, and, which is when we made the show really good. So don't worry about it. It's not cut when it comes back. And secondly, there was... There, I, there were so many songs j jostled and cut. Was there one that you remember? No, but there's the Alexander's Yeah, we won't there, talk about that. I mean, of that. course, there are, there are probably four or five or six songs 
that that David wrote for the show that are not in the show, which is fairly typical for the development musical. But I don't think there's any that we're, you know, uh, yeah, dying over the fact that we. I mean, in in fact, the, the the actual story is almost the opposite. I mean, the question's for you, so you should maybe answer. But the, <laughs> but but we oh, but the song that Katrina is going to sing in a minute um, was not in the show. For he had written it, we put it in the show, we cut it somewhere along the way, and then added it back later, much to our happiness. Wait, before you answer that, what was it like to have the song cut after having been done it? Because the song is beautiful, and it's, an, it's like a, a great piece of the show. I wasn't there when that happened. Oh, you weren't when, there when, when I came happened. on, the song it was, was in fine. the show. It had been it was, restored. You yeah. like in the middle of the process, and like, we're cutting your song. Shut like, up. No, <laughs> yeah, man. it was none of that. Yeah. No, that would have been rough. That would have been, been rough. That would have been rough. It happened. That kind of stuff happens, and that's the hardest part of the process. It's telling someone, you know that beautiful song, the one where everyone was crying in the audience and they loved it and it really stopped the show? The one that could change your life forever the one that could when change an your life. critic sees it? Yes, what about it? Well, it stopped the show. <laughs> Not in the right way. And then you cut it and, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, over here. Um, I was wondering, uh, have you been uh, listening to some of the audience reactions since it was off-Broadway until now when it's on Broadway and has any of that affected the show or uh, changed the show? Oh, that's a good question for, for Katrina. Like, during the show, like, the audience reaction? Yeah. Uh, we try not to notice. <laughs> uh, that's, but it's really hard not to notice the audience reactions. Um, uh, they're, they vary a lot, depending on the day of the week, actually. Um, and we're still trying to figure out the science of like what's going on on Fridays. What are, what's with people on Wednesday? What's and going on? And the weather on? too. I mean. The the weather. And there's just a, a you know a larger audience off Broadway. We had like 200 people I think in the house, and now we have over a thousand. So it's just like a, a wider swath of people. Um, what I what I noticed when I saw the show a week ago, and I sat in a balcony and I did something I'm not supposed to do, which is I turned and looked at the audience a lot of the time, because I was trying to gauge that. Why am I not supposed to do that? Because I kind of look like a, creep. a threatening yeah. creep. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I did it. And what I noticed is, you know, we opened, we got all these amazing reviews, like pretty, pretty spectacular reviews. The word of mouth has been great. It builds, it builds. So everyone comes in, <laughs> you know, you get the wind at your back in a way. Everyone comes in ready to laugh at the jokes, ready to cry at the, the stuff. And I think uh, what I also noticed was that and this is key, is that the cast doesn't succumb to the, uh, to the, to that, to the, to the temptation of playing towards it. Um, and that's really important, because as soon as they do, you lose, you know, whatever the special thing is, you, you take a little bit of the edge off of it, a little of the gloss off of it. Um, so, yeah, did you know, have you noticed that? Like, I mean... I tried not to know. There's a point, I mean, there's a point, part of the answer to your question is a point beyond which we're not allowed to change it anymore. Like once we opened at the Barrymore, we're not really allowed to change the text or, or stuff like that. Um, but there was a period between Off-Broadway and Broadway when we could, we had gleaned an enormous amount of information from watching the Off-Broadway audiences watch it. And just, it's more, it's almost sort of just feeling a general sense of the level of engagement or elect electricity in the room and like where the people are leaning in and where maybe you think you lose them. And you try to apply that to changes you want to make. So, so that guided us somewhat with like little tweaks and refinements we made for Broadway. But then at a certain point, we just had to let it go. Right. Without pandering to the audience, the idea is always to listen very intently to try to follow the audience's experience and, and, uh, and, not, and have respect for it. I think so much so with something like this as well, where you are not consistently trying to dazzle them with or with spectacle you are actually trying to draw them into something that is kind of dry and emotional and beautiful and then have the songs come in right so i'd imagine even more so you're kind of focused on how the audience reacts consistently joke by joke almost often shows for live audiences often are are hyper aware of a of a very active relationship with the audience yeah. and we're, we're trying to have a subliminal relationship with the audience, and ideally we're hoping that the audience has the experience of overhearing the play, um, as opposed to we're all here together. Because since it's a play, because if we were all here together, then some of the isolation of the characters would be difficult to live in truthfully, because if we're here with a thousand people, then we're fine. Everything's okay, we're not isolated anywhere. We're in Midtown.
uh, Katrina, how did, did you find that you did, do you modify or change your performance going coming from the Atlantic to Broadway? We try not to notice. <laughs> uh, I I don't remember actually. I don't remember what was different in how our characters were portrayed off Broadway, which maybe is good. Yeah. Um, and Cromer was really great with us. Uh, if we ever did feel the urge, which you often feel when you see more people, is to make sure that the person way up there can still see this thing, of, you know, this part of the story. And Cromer was always really good about saying, it's, it's okay, they can see you. It's, you don't, you know, don't push. Um, so it feels the same uh, as before, but that could be because I've completely forgotten. <laughs> it was inc it, the thing we grew the thing incrementally I would say yeah. we thought we were going to do that we probably failed while we were trying to do it but ultimately day by day from the Atlantic we went into a bigger rehearsal hall every day we were doing the show from the Atlantic we started to realize this might read this might not read we were in a much bigger rehearsal hall that was easily the size of the Atlantic then we moved into a big theater and we had a lot of time on stage so I think it probably got bigger by inches mm -hmm. it was a game of inches so that eventually so that it was a, a uh, slowly expanded so that it was it was uh, that it was readable that 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 the people in the back weren't getting anything thrown to them but were given uh, an open channel to be able to see very clearly what was on stage a, a wormhole a t you know a, a wormhole in space to get you know to the stage it's a tightrope walk too because if you go a little too far it really would affect that engagement that we were talking about. And there was just, I like to tell this story, because there was this moment when I was sitting there, the veteran of several other Broadway shows, all of which were, you know, even Women on the Verge, which were kind of, to some extent, bought into either just the, the laugh is the currency, you know, or big, colorful kind of stuff. And um, there I was, knowing that what we were doing was right, and that what David Cromer was doing was more than right, like was perfect, but there was this one moment that involved Katrina, and, and it's this long, silent moment where she's making coffee. Right. Clink, clink. And I'm sitting there like, there's no way, there is no way that an audience is gonna, you know, this was, in the, this was when we were in the 200 seat theater. And I remember just turning to Dave and I goes, listen, a, a lot of these pauses are good. Most of the pauses are good. That's a crap pause. And, and you, you turned to me and you went, that's a crap pause? <laughs> like, what does that mean? I go, yeah, that's a crap pause. That's not a good pause. And that same night, I watched the show from the audience, which is you know, in, within the audience, which some I usually don't do, because I'm an antsy guy. And uh, during that pause, when she's making the, you know, silently making the, I just look around me, and everybody in the audience is like, yeah, literally <laughs> leaning, leaning in uh, an inch or two. And that's when I just sort of, relaxed about the whole, that whole thing. I mean, because it really, when, when, when you see people that engaged with the, the performers on the stage or the, or the lines that are written or my songs, there's no, you just, there's no naysaying that, you know? Yeah. So I stopped naysaying. Yeah, it's like the plate does this roll of the dice at, at the top, sort of um, asking the audience to come to it a little bit. But without doing that, it could never have the emotional impact that we're going for at the end. So it's sort of like, you're, yeah, tightrope walk is a good. And you could never get away with that sort of co making coffee pause if you didn't sort of set up the rules of the show at the, at the top with, I think, you know, the curtain, you know, the lights come up and it's a very sort of long pause, right, before we get to some talking. And then there's a few kind of like dry moments revealing, kind of revealing who these guys guys are, which like if you didn't have that, by the time you got to the coffee cup, you'd be like, why am I watching this woman make coffee? There's one other thing, which is there, the pieces of the puzzle come together, but for me, so much of the puzzle comes together when the musicians are playing music. It's sort of like, what is this about? What is this about? And then you see people really communicating through music on stage, and a lot of it's improvised, so you're really seeing it, and it all just sort of, you just realize something about communication and about dancing with each other and, and communicating through music. And, uh, you know, that's part of the tone as well. Right. It doesn't sound fun when we say, you should come. There's a lot of long silences. <laughs> you should I'm come to the show, which is really, really like, if you have a headache and you don't want to hear any words, you should come, come to the band's visit. Yes, no, I'm not it? saying that. Because, but, 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 but sometimes, occasionally, very carefully calibrated silence 
helps what you then hear. It becomes about what you are going to hear. And for people who are struggling very hard to communicate, what ends up being one of the things they can do is experience music together. Yeah, in a way, one of the things it's about is that there's actually no such thing as silence. That in a, that in a silence, there's not, I don't even literally like the sound of the desert wind, although that too, but like people's inner, the sort of inner cry of their emotions, their yearnings, their longings. And you know. I turn that, in my mind, I turn that around to almost a John Cage kind of thing, which is that everything is music. Yeah. Everything. So the movement of, the co of making the coffee in silence or a certain line or a word in Arabic or in Hebrew uh, is music. You know, if you, you can perceive the whole world as music um, or a gesture as music, if it all comes together that way, uh, it's a very beautiful way of seeing the, the world. Yeah, Katrina even has a line where she asks uh, Tufik, the leader of the band, to say something in Arabic, and she says, you know, just so I can hear the music. So it's, yeah, it's really explicitly the currency. Uh, I think we have time for one more question right here. Hi. Hi, I, I love your show so much. I have the Bands with a Pop Socket on my phone, and it's, <laughs> it's a good pop socket, it right? sparked so many friendships and conversations. <laughs> and, it, and it also mitigates carpal tunnel. <laughs> Oh, wow. All right. We're here to well, heal. We're here, well, to, we're heal. here to heal. <laughs> well, my adv uh, question is, do you have any advice for aspiring actors and writers in theater? Uh, actors? Do you have any advice for aspiring? <laughs> Buckle up. Um, <laughs> our patience, I think, to uh, hang in there and if... Just hang in there. It's can like a long, it's a long road. Can I give you something more practical than that? Uh, um, I just came back from, you know, that's, that's no, not no, an insult. I want to hear. Um, I just came back from teaching uh, in Minnesota, University of Minnesota, theater and music departments. And what I found that I was saying a lot was always be doing something. Meaning if you're a writer, just keep keep writing. And if you're an actor, find ways to do stuff. And what that means in this situation possibly is find other people who will just do stuff with you see what I'm saying like you can do stuff that isn't where you're not waiting for uh, the phone to ring you make it happen if you're an actor write something and do it you know I heard Lin-Manuel say he wrote in the heights because he couldn't he didn't see himself getting cast and stuff unless he wrote it um, but it works on every on every level and if you're uh, a writer, it's the same thing. You hook up with a bunch of people who will say your words, put a little table reading together, just keep doing it. And one other thing is keep doing more than just what you consider to be your identity. If you're a writer, um, try writing lyrics as well. If you're a writer, try some acting and vice versa and try some directing. Does that, does that? Absolutely, absolutely. And I want to piggyback on the patience uh, idea, which is, which is there is often, particularly for a younger person, a feeling that particularly because a lot of the, often many of the sort of actors you admire are 16 years old, 18 years old, 23 years old, and you think, if this doesn't happen now, something is wrong. Everything is passing me by. You're an actor till you die. You're an actor till the day you die. And you don't, and, and patience is a big part of it. And there isn't, there, you're, there aren't two options. There aren't only two options, utter and complete failure or stardom and success. There is a life of work and artistry and relationships and creation that you can do all, that you can constantly, and, and that ties into working, can constantly be creating. If you find, particularly now when you can play a character and put it on YouTube and people will follow it. You know what I mean? You can write a character for yourself and perform in your living room and put it on Instagram, you know, where you can, where, where we have control the means of, of communication now. Um, uh, that's, that's, uh, so just always be creating, you know? I think also it's important for people to remember that so few things that creative people do end up or are a Broadway show. And like, uh, and you know, whatever you do, even if it's not a Broadway show, you know, you are going to learn from it and you are going to find some kind of satisfaction. You may not get Broadway or off Broadway or a Hollywood movie. Or you, you know? may. I mean, or you, you know, may, yeah. I, I made I three, may you. I, I made, <laughs> I made, I think I had three albums that I had made that, sold increase decreasingly well you know <laughs> and um and you know so i never really made any money from that but those those albums having worked on them and really cared about them and having toured with my band and stuff those were the reason why i got hired to do my first broadway show you know that's just a a, a facile example but it's a real one 
Pizza Mar, where the work was your... I love is the work of mine that I is, means an enormous amount to me. There are pieces of work I've done in 40 seat theaters for 20 performances that are just as important to me as anything I did that made a lot of money or got me on, got me a here I'd build, you know, or anything like that, you know. Pizza Mar, where was your where was your first show? My my first uh, play, my my very first like professional production of a play was because I won a playwriting prize for five hundred dollars. In that I found in the back of the dramatist source book, and part of the prize was they put on my play in the little black box theater in Bloomington, Indiana. Amazing. And it was one step from there to hear an AOL build. It was just, <laughs> no, nothing in No, what I mean, what I. I and when you this got is, to Bloomington, they're like, what do you want to do next? And you're like, I want to go on this thing, AOL build, that doesn't exist yet, yeah, but I'm going to yeah. make it. Right, because this was. 2000 or whatever. Um, is AOL build short for building? This is the AOL building? Was that what you were asking? No, it's because they're building a like community of conversation. Oh, okay. Right? I see. It's more that. Yeah, that's a verb. it. Verb. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's not a noun. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You're the writer, so you would know that. Because you know, what about what? What about you? What about what was your first professional show that you did? It's gonna. It's gonna be uh, like Broadway. It's gonna. Be <laughs> uh, I think it was a. It was a production of My Fair Lady, in a dinner theater. <laughs> And uh, I really wanted to be Eliza Doolittle, of course, and I was cast as a busker. Yeah, and I had to do a cartwheel on a, a man's legs somehow. I did it. <laughs> I did that cartwheel. Because it paid me. Yeah. Um, you guys do you remember what the specials were the night you first did the <laughs> salmon? Like, did they serve a fish and a meat? Was there a chicken involved? Dinner theater. There was a lot of jello. I recall seeing a lot of like. <laughs> The perfect theater <laughs> dessert. You want to go loud. see My Fair Lady? They have Jello. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love the show. Congratulations! It's uh, on Broadway right now. Uh, go see it. You'll love it. If you haven't seen it, if you have seen it, go see it again and stick around. Katrina's going to perform uh, Omar Sharif, a beautiful song from the show. Everybody, give them a round of applause for the band's visit. Let's hear it. Yeah.